I'm very happy to be uh, with you, even though it's not in person, but this is a good second best. And uh, also to present something which has been cooking for quite a while uh, with different versions, but now I think it has reached the point where it's going to be uh, good for writing. Unfortunately, the paper is not quite there yet. All right, so uh, joint work with Anna. So what's the problem? I mean, in a sense, it's a very simple version of the fair division uh, problem because we simply have, uh, in addition to the indivisible goods, we have cash compensations. So there is money freely available, just like in transferable utility games, just like also in combinatorial auctions. And we can use those to, to perform compensation. So those who get the nice objects uh, can compensate the other by paying them. And, and the arbitrary number of participants and the rights can be easily made to be exogenous and different in this context, but I will stick to the equal rights for simplicity of notations and everything. And the key assumptions, as you see, is this classic thing known in economics as quasi-linear utilities. I don't think I need to go over that in details, but the, what's important here, of course, is some notation, SI. SI will denote the share of agent I, where the share of agent I is the set of objects. So capital A here is the set of objects. I is an agent. SI is whatever object he or she gets. Notice, and that's important, that SI could very well be empty. If your value for the object is low, you may get nothing, but you will be compensated for the fact that you have been nicely giving your object to the others. And then in addition to those partition to this, I still call it partition, but technically it's a slightly modified definition with the empty shares, but we still, we still distribute everything. We cannot leave some objects unassigned. Then in addition, we have the possibility of performing any vector of transfer, sigma of ti equals zero, meaning that they are balanced. So in the end, what, what your utility is, is a UI of SI, that's the cardinal value uh, in monetary terms of the share SI plus the transfer ti, okay? So the advantages of this context are well known. Uh, it's cardinal measure of welfare, the fact that you have the cash transfers, you can smooth out indivisibility. Therefore, you never have an issue of approximating fairness concept. I mean, everything is done <clears throat> continuously and um, with exact uh, concepts. It's also realistic. I mean, it's <laughs> the claim I make here in this slide is that it has not been much studied. There is only one case where it has been studied rather thoroughly, but before the algorithmic uh, GT and algorithmic uh, fair division, that was the assignment case where you have, let's say, N agents, N objects, and you, can, you should assign one object per person plus the monetary uh, transfers. So uh, there, uh, yes, I mean, there, there is a serious literature dealing with incentives and all kinds of aspects, aspects that I'm not dealing with today. But apart from that case, very little, very little. I have something in 92, which was in the Arrow de Bro context, but uh, not, uh, it's related to some of the stuff today. But, okay. So now it is realistic. I mean, if, if you think of, you know, there is this nice, uh, uh, mechanism which is in the law, in the, in the books, uh, still in Texas, even though I asked some specialists, they say it's not really uh, used that often, which is called Texas Shootout. It's a very simple uh, mechanism to break a partnership. So you are, you are with a partner, uh, you jointly own the, the thing, and you want to break away or buy the stuff. So you, you claim a price, you say, I'll at the price of 10, you can either have my share or uh, I buy your share. So if you think about it a minute, it's equivalent to this uh, person making a single bid for the object, which is full ownership, and then the other accepts or not. So in the end, uh, everyone gets at least uh, half of the value of the object for himself. But, uh, but it's, uh, you know, here it's clearly the, 
the indivisibility of the of the partnership, which is solved by the fact that you sell. Division of the rent between flatmate, that's one of the classics of fair division models, which is, for instance, on the split um, uh, website. And there too, uh, it's uh, the business of the cash compensation, assigning noxious and or desirable facilities that the thing where essentially, I mean, that's sort of standard practice. You, you have to locate somewhere some, some waste facilities or some prison and so forth, and you end up compensating whichever communities uh, take. Okay. All right, so let's start. Uh, so the claim I want to make here is that maybe, maybe one reason the, this framework has been neglected by fair division is because it appears to be too easy if you make the classic assumption of additive utilities. Then really you don't have much of an issue. Let's, let's see why. I mean, so additive utility means that your, your utility for the set capital S is simply the sum of these utility UIA. So your full, your full utility is described by these M numbers if M is the number of objects. So the simple classic multi-auction mechanism works perfectly in that case. Notice that uh, I, the warning here is that I'm not going to go into serious incentives, you know, strategy proofness or Nash equilibrium. I'm just going to look at uh, what I call safe, safe um, messages, safe strategy. Do the thing which is uh, maximizing the worst payoff, and let's see what you can guarantee there. Now, if you play, if you like to strategize and do fancy things, that's fine, but that's at your own risk. You may end up suffering from it and we are not concerned by that normatively. Okay, so what's the multi-auction for this case of additive utility? Simply on each object, you run an auction, a simple auction. So each agent bids for each object with a number, uh, I put it positive or negative because at this stage it could well be a good or a bad. And then the object goes to the highest bidder let's call it I star of A, one of the highest bidders. And the bid, that winning bid is split equally among everybody, including the, the bidder. So the bidder who bid uh, 100 among four people, and if he wins, he's gonna have to pay three times uh, 25 and he keeps 25 for himself. So he's gonna pay 75 to the other and end up with a net benefit of 25. In other words, in this mechanism, whether you win or you bid or you lose the auction, you are guaranteed for yourself one nth of the value of the object bi, the value that the object is uh, for yourself. Huh? Uh, if you lose, you will get more because the winning bid will be divided in n and you will get one nth of that, that's fine. But at least you are guaranteed one nth of the value of your bid. And you are, and, and bidding truthfully at this stage is the only way to guarantee it in a way which is totally uh, prior free, which does not depend on what the others are doing, right? So the simple fact is that this safe play, I mean, of opt which optimizes the worst case is indeed the truthful bid. That's very, very easy to see. It guarantees to each agent a nice fair share the classic fair share going back to Steinhaus, et cetera, or, uh, which I, I, think of, I think of here as the, the ex ante fairness for this problem. It also guarantees that you will not be envious, again, because you are playing safe. Uh, you are playing safe. You, on each object, you will get no envy because, uh, if, again, if you are winning, you are giving exactly the same share to uh, all the losers as the benefit you have. And if you are losing, you are uh, not envious because the, the, the winner is paying so much money, you would not want to do that. So by just being sincere and not knowing anything about the rest of the world, you guarantee ex ante fairness and ex post fairness in the sense of envy free, okay? Uh, because of course, it, the envy freeness adds up uh, good by good because we are additive utilities. 
And moreover, finally, if we all play safe, the resulting allocation is Pareto optima. Okay, so it's, you really cannot ask for much more, right? You have efficiency and you have the two canonical forms of fairness, ex ante and ex post. So, and notice that, you know, there, there are water ways, well, so that's not, not important. Um, the, the point here is how far can we go in these nice directions um, when, when you have complex uh, combinatorial uh, utilities, okay? So the, the, this is complicated, of course, uh, to have all the, um, all the externalities. So for most of the talk, I, I'm, res, I'm restricting assumption to monotone utilities. So in other words, the objects are weakly desirable. Okay, as you will see at the end, it, they probably will not have, probably not have time, but it's possible to deal without this uh, thing, without this assumption, but certainly to fix ID and for a lot of the discussions, we, we will need that. So weekly monotone, important normalization here, and the zero represents no object, so the prior situation. Okay, so what kind of issues will we be discussing? Two types, very fairly different, but in my mind, impossible to really separate. Okay, the first one is conceptual because what was so fairly obvious and intuitive in the case of additive utilities, it's a, what does it mean to be ex ante fair? Well, it's the fair share. What does it mean to be exposed fair? Uh, well, it's envy freeness. Um, it doesn't work anymore, in my opinion, when you have more complicated utilities. And in fact, there, there, there are some, some serious uh, issues and trade-off. And the, so we will explain that. That will be in some sense the first part. And then there is also, and that's the, the more difficult part, probably the, the practical issue that, which is the one that has been the, the problem for a long time in the combinatorial auction, is that in a combinatorial auction type of situation, with a reasonably uh, small, you know, reasonably uh, a dozen objects. I mean, there is no way you can ask participants to reveal a, val a cardinal valuation on each subset. It's just too complicated. So can we, what can we do if our mechanism uh, elicit messages which are reasonably simple? Right, um, <clears throat> and, and okay, so the standard reason why you cannot ask for too much is, you know, the cognitive effort is too much. And there is an alternative uh, explanation of justification, which I like too, which is in some sense, the dual of the, the cognitive explanation, which is that it's, it's very bad for privacy to be revealing all your trade-offs, all your externalities over a bunch of objects. Imagine in the, you know, in the context of this uh, FCC auction and the companies telling you exactly, uh, you know, you know too much. So it's, it's good that the mechanism doesn't force you to reveal too much, right? A bit like, uh, you know, divide and choose. Oh, I just, I just divide in two shares. I don't tell you that much at all about my, my utility. So that's good too. Okay, of course, the one consequence here will be that we cannot hope to get full efficiency when people reveal partial messages, but that's fact of life. Uh, that's nothing surprising. So what we will do after discussing the, the, the normative um, issues, the, the conceptual issues, is propose a new mechanism, right? A new mechanism where essentially the report of the agents are um, like a price, are a price, uh, except that if you have only two agents, you only one of them needs to reveal a price. I mean, uh, we'll see that. Um, but essentially they, they will bid to become the seller, the, the person who will sell the objects to the other person. But the bid, the key is that the bid will be uh, winning if it's the smallest. So uh, you will say, oh, I think that the whole total value of the object is 10 and you, you are bidding 30. So it's important that I become the buyer, not you. Because 
at 30, you probably will, we certainly will want some object more than me. So by letting you be the buyer, we will both end up with some benefit. Uh, so you, you will see the, the general idea is, is there, but uh, of course you have to be precise, okay? And, and, what, um, and as far as realism, uh, the, 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 the statement is that, you know, reporting a price, a list of values for each um, commodities, or of course, making a purchase decision. I mean, you're giving me the price, I decide which object I buy that's completely uh, acceptable in terms of uh, practicalities. I mean, for instance, on split did it, it's done routinely for the, the fair division of indivisible objects. And, and you are asked you know, to report uh, prices uh, as if you had additive utilities. And well, you adjust to that if you perceive, even if you perceive that your utilities are actually not addit additive, but uh, okay. So that's, that's the thing. Uh, so, on this uh, Hervé, 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 yes. Hervé. Yes. I, I don't understand. I mean, I know you have not defined, but I, I didn't understand what you mean by an optimal purchase. I don't know if you want oh, to explain oh. it now or should we wait until you get to that well, point? No, no, it's just that since, since there will be a round of bid, simple bid on one amount of money to become the seller and then you lose or so you become the buyer. So I choose a price and then you choose the object that you buy. At, the, at my price, okay? Again, the, between two people, the mechanist will have this simple two steps or three. First, we bid uh, a number, uh, which is supposed to be the, like something connected to the full valuation of the, all the object in your mind, okay? The person with the lowest bid wins the auction, and now he's in the position to ask to sell the object at a certain price, at, at a given price that he chooses object per object on the condition, of course, that the total price was indeed the bid that he formulated in the first place. Of course, because at that point he cannot charge you any price. He has to charge a price which is constrained by the initial bid. And you who are the, now the buyer, you only revealed one amount of information your bid, and after that, you, you have to buy or not buy. You, if, you don't, if you don't like my prices, you may buy nothing, which probably means that you didn't bid safely because <coughs> since you claim that the total value of the goods for you is higher than for me, some goods at the price that I propose, which some to are constrained by the sum, uh, some goods must be better for you. But okay, that's your problem. Okay. I don't know if you, uh, there was a game theory conference many years ago that Shmuel Zamir ran an experiment, which I think was, was very similar to your mechanism. There was bidding for the, the one that becomes the manager or something, and then he <coughs> tries to get the money from the rest. Uh, uh, Bill, Lucas, uh, Bill Lucas won, won the tournament twice, and uh, <laughs> I don't know if you were at that conference. Was Where it was like that, a Bill Feld one or something like was, that? No, it was in Ohio. Oh okay. yeah, the big one with Chaplet and all that in the... Uh... Okay. okay, so you see, maybe that was in my subconscious. I mean, I was in <laughs> Ohio, but very young. So... Yeah, so you were very young. We'll you see were very it, young. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so Hervé, can yeah. I ask a question? So yes. the, for the N agent case, um, you say mm -hmm. that each agent reports up to N minus one prices. Are they associated yes. with specific items or just a list of numbers? Okay, uh, yes. Uh, and for the N, N agent cases, it's a recursive definition. So we will, let's say we have three people. At first, we all do one bid to be among the two sellers, because there okay. will be two sellers and one buyer. So the okay. two smallest bids are sellers. Mm -hmm. The highest bid becomes a buyer. The buyer faces now a sum of two prices, the price by the first seller and the price by the second seller, both of them mm -hmm. constrained by the fact that they, they total to whatever amount they announced in their bid. So the buyer makes her decision of buying or not, exits and now we are left with fewer objects these two uh, these two persons now become a involved in the two person uh, problem 
And okay. every iteration oh. is constrained by all previous iterations. No, 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 the second, no? no, the second iteration becomes, you know, where now we change our prices because uh, it's a subset. Uh, we didn't have that in mind before. So in the second iteration, now we just look at whatever objects are left. Now you and I are left. Okay, so let's start again. Now we bid for the value of this total object. We do the same thing, but for a smaller number. So that's why it, it takes a few rounds, but clearly- So those know, N minus one prices are not simultaneous. They are no, sequential. No, no, so no, in each no. round, there is just one price. No, because exactly. the, uh, exactly. I also understood it that you immediately say N minus one prices. Like no, I think no, that's no. what Michal also no, no, had in no. mind. No, yes. no, but it's sequential. You announce every round right. there is just one price. Right. Okay, okay, then okay. that would make much more sense. Yeah, okay. Sorry, okay. Herve, uh, yeah? clarification, every round, only the lowest bidder make a, li make a list of prices? No, only the N minus one lowest bidders are allowed to sell. How can okay. they sell the same thing? Okay. There is a, okay? Okay. If you okay. want, I mean, I can change the ordering of the, of the talk and go straight to the mechanism to be more precise because yeah. uh, maybe, maybe uh, I think we should I think we should wait to see the mechanism because uh, there are some things to clarify. So. Okay, yeah, for sure, for sure. So let, yeah. let's go very quickly about the, the conceptual issues and um, uh, but just what I want to say is two things. I mean, exposed fairness, as described by Andy Freeness in that model, is not obvious, is not that convincing. It has, in fact, a, a very serious challenge by uh, a constraint which is called the standalone upper bound, which is very natural and sounds mild, but is good enough to already kill envy freeness. And in fact, also ex ante fairness in the sense of defining, defining what it could be to, have a to give a fair share. Uh, well, what's the interpretation of fair share when things are no longer additive? It amounts to a choice of one among many possible definitions, so-called guarantees, but the good ones, those natural ones, are not compatible with NV freeness. So very quickly, why, why the standalone of upper bound? So this is the, the story. Uh, these three people, and Bob and Carol, they share a flat where only one of the bedroom has its own TV, okay? That's the only cost we are considering the flat is already paid for. Anne never watches TV. Bob and Carol do watch, do like to have TV, especially in their room. So they must decide who gets the TV and how the others, how much the others should be uh, compensated. So Bob and Carol are each ready to pay 120 shekels per month for the room with TV. That's their valuation for having this extra feature in their room. If we apply in differentness here with the possibility of those compensation, what it tells us is it must be either Bob or Carol who gets the TV. And this person must pay one third of exactly 120 because there are two of them with the top valuations. That is to say, this person must pay 40 shekels to Bob, to, to the other, the, the one who likes TV, but also 40 shekels to Anne. And that's the problem. That's where you can object. You say, look, I mean, what was the value of Anne's sacrifice? She doesn't care for TV. You put the TV in her room, she just uh, put it behind the plant, right? So, so that's not, um, that's not the, you know, it, it's a problem. And it is reflects, the, the way to go around it is to say, look, there is something I want to impose is that in the share that you get, once you take into account the object you get plus the transfer, it should not be better than just getting all the goods for yourself. Remember, they are goods. And this is a discussion in the context of goods. Okay, so that's one interpretation. But now you reverse a tiny bit the thing and you get a, a, a situation where NV3 is more palatable than standalone. I mean, so this time, Anne, Ball, and Carol have the joint usufruct, and that's a, this legal term, which is in fact rather precise, of a flat in Tel Aviv that they normally time share without cash transfers. For two years, Anne and Bob were unable to travel to Israel. That's 
my application of uh, game theory to the study of COVID. Uh, and Carol, Carol was the full-time occupant because she, she, she lives in Israel, right? So because the flat was useless to them during this time, the standalone upper bond means that Carol should not compensate Anne and Bob, okay? But on the other hand, if having equal rights means having equal rights to the usufruct of the flat, in a, in a legal sense, it means that if one of the co-owner of the usufruct benefits from it, he has to compensate the others. And therefore, in this case, and be free means something. So you see that uh, really this is a discussion that goes straight into the, the context of the, and, and I'm not pretending to, 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 uh, to discuss, uh, to, to decide uh, between the two. I mean, uh, it's just that those are two ideas. They are not compatible. One is to bound the, your total benefit by uh, the total value of the goods and the other is NV free. And by the way, you have the same oppositions in the context of BADs. When you divide BADs, suppose you divide chores, chores, there the, the equivalent of the standalone upper bound is uh, even more convincing, I believe, which is that whatever share of the chores I give you and whatever compensation in total, your net change of utility should go in the negative because we are all sharing bad. So maybe you will do all the chores, Sergio, because for you, for, their, for you, they don't cost much, but then we, the others, we will pay you for that. So in effect, we all end up with something, some negative utility. So that's a very natural uh, bound that you can impose. But it's also easy to check that it's not compatible with, with envy freeness uh, combined with, um, with Pareto optimality. So, you know, there, there, are, there are these kind of issues. So this- Oh, Hervé, Hervé, I don't know if what, I mean, yes. and I, have to, I mean, I don't have a good answer, but I have a question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know how to solve it, but somehow it doesn't seem like the claim of Anne and Bob is valid. I mean, they couldn't come. Uh, it's not the fact that Carol enjoyed the full flat and she was, uh, yeah, it's not, it's, uh, I mean, uh, tough luck. I mean, so some of them are constraints. If you put constraints, yes. you have to take those into account before you start talking about any freeness. I don't yes, know. But, that. but uh, that's why, that's why I use the term usufruct because I, at least in the French law, when you have share of the usufruct, that means you are entitled to a share of the benefit of enjoying, of consuming that thing. And therefore, the fact that you consume and you get a benefit from it entitles me to a share of this benefit. Imagine, okay, another example, you know. But suppose, I mean, Carol could rent out those other two rooms to some other people and get money, that would go to Ann and Bob. But if that's not feasible, again, there is a question of feasibility. Yes. What is possible? Yes, then yes, yes. No, no, it's true. I mean, but there is also a question of rights. I mean, um, you know, you are a citizen of a country where there are some very nice uh, type of mushroom which are worth a lot of money and you hate those mushrooms, you never will be touching them. Nevertheless, the rent that are obtained by the community based on those mushrooms, you are part, you, you are entitled to it because that's one interpretation of being in that community. Anyway, it, it's, um, you know, okay. it's just to say, uh, the, the point is that in the mechanism I will uh, propose, you will not be able to satisfy, to make a strong argument for envy freeness. So it's good to have an alternative um, interpretation to understand that envy freeness is not, uh, uh, you know, the alpha and omega of the problem. Okay, so we just keep in mind the two interpretation. Okay. Ex ante fairness in that context, what does it mean? So it becomes really a complicated issue. Um, we could think of the fair share, but we will dismiss it in an instant with uh, the next example, but more generally, it leads to, uh, to a serious concept. And the, con the concept is that of guarantee. A guarantee really means exactly what the fair share does. It's a, it's a level of utility which you can get by a certain message, which is legal for you, which is available, irrespective of what the rest of the participants do. 
So a guarantee will tell you for each utility alone, as well as number of agents, N, um, a certain utility level, gamma N of U, N is number of agents and U is your utility, your own, such that if you take any profile, uh, U star, here the notation U star is for the profile U1 to UN of one utility per person. For any profile, if you can compute the sum of the guarantees, it's gonna be less than the total surplus available in the economy. That's the expression max of U uh, arrow uh, pi. And what is that? It's over here. It's, uh, it's the maximal, the efficient way, the efficient way of distributing the object so as to maximize total surplus. And it's well known that in the quasi-linear context, it means this is the only way to, to be uh, Pareto optimal, to be efficient, is you implement that distribution of the object, and then you can play with the transfer in any way you want that will not affect the efficiency. So, so WU is the efficient surplus in the economy. And because of these inequalities, it is always feasible to get to achieve that level. So as long as you have that, it's a meaningful definition of your fair share. It's abstract, but you see already that the one thing that you have already is the fact that it's anonymous. I mean, it's the same. It doesn't depend on your name. Now, what's particularly desirable is a high guarantee. A high guarantee, the, the higher it is, the more protected is your welfare in terms of protection from the, your un, lack of information about the others or their, their aggressive behavior against you and so forth, uh, even when the rest of agents are adversarial. So you call a guarantee maximal if no matter, if, if whenever there is another guarantee which happens to be larger, well, they can only be uh, equal. So you, you cannot, you have given to each utility a certain level guarantee and there would no way you could push up even one of them without breaking the feasibility condition at some profile, okay? So it's a, it's a strong property and-, and So it's, it's, a Rolls, it's a Rolls type of criterion? Am I right? Do I understand correctly? It's like caring no, it's about the worst. Well, yeah. If you, the, the thing is, you it's the highest to, level. At the highest level, that the worst, uh, the worst of us is going to be. Yes, yes. But the point is the dependency upon the utility function. That's that's where the all of the interest uh, resides. Well, okay, uh, so. still, Ross, it's behind the veil of ignorance. It only depends. Uh, yes. Oh, yes. It's before knowing yes. who you are, it's a yes, universal kind of bound. That aspect, yes. But that's what uh, is usually called the ex ante fairness. You know, the ex ante fairness is really under the veil of ignorance, where you you only know your your utility and, in this case, the number of agents. So, here is the important example, because of course, the going back to the fair share, one over n of u of a, it is still something that we can call a guarantee. It is it is a guarantee in this model. Why? Well, because here we have goods. So suppose I want to give one end of U of the whole bundle to each agent. Well, I just go back to my Texas shootout or my single uh, auction. I just auctions the object as a bundle, right? You take a bundle, you say, okay, it's for sale. You, you bid and the person gets everything. So according to the, then if you want, since there is a single object, which is the bundle, everybody's utility is additive. There is no byte to additivity. So therefore, therefore, in that case, um, therefore this uh, thing is feasible, right? Um, but, um, but it's not good. <laughs> it's not good um, for essentially for many reasons, but uh, one which is very compelling in my view is when you look at this kind of situation where you have, okay, you have a, the set of objects and you have a bunch of agents and some of them are the extremely, extremely super additive, have the extremely super additive utility, UG, I call them greedy, meaning that for any subset, which is neither uh, empty nor the whole set, 
no utility. They only get utility one when if they eat everything. Anything else is worthless. And the opposite, the opposite extreme, extreme subadditivity is the frugal, the frugal uh, agent for whom even a single object is enough to get full utility. It's the assignment context, if you want. You only need one object. And, and the problem is that in any, in any situation where you have some greedy, some frugal agent, the fair share will not distinguish them. We'll, we'll treat them as, uh, yeah, I mean, from the point of view of what's exente fair, the fact that you, you as a super additive, very greedy agent, you would only uh, capture all the objects for creating any surplus, whereas the frugal person is actually uh, only asking one of the uh, items out of all, may, all uh, how many, um, makes a difference. It should be, and they, this becomes, a, in my view, an axiom. I mean, it should be that um, the greedy gets a guarantee which is less than that of the frugal. Okay, so just just that. I mean, without asking, you know, being more precise, uh, choosing a mechanism, choosing uh, will, will actually tell us how to do it. But um, okay, so here is the definition: a guarantee. Uh, the guarantee with the feasibility property, we will call it positive if it says that whenever you get some benefit, uh, so if for you the objects are not worthless, you should get something. Uh, so greedy, we consider that greedy deserves something because he's the co-owner. Sure, he has very special preference about it, but he's letting maybe the others uh, sharing it in a more efficient way. But uh, we should compensate it somehow, a bit, something. And similarly, uh, we should not compensate uh, as much the greedy than the frugal. So these are the two, the two natural requirements, which especially the second, uh, which kills the fair share. And here is a very simple, a very simple remark, uh, is that there is a trade-off between these kind of guarantees that we are really interested in and nv 3 uh, In other words, if a guarantee has these properties of positivity and discrimination, um, it cannot be uh, nv 3 It cannot be compatible with nv 3 eh? if, you, if you have a guarantee satisfying- If you make it, if you make it weak discriminating, which yeah. means inequality rather than strict inequality, then, then there is a solution? Yes. Uh, yes, then there is the fair share, one over N, U of A. Okay. That's, uh, mm. that, that works. Oh, everybody gets, okay, everybody. Uh, yes, uh, that's the one which in, in a sense completely obfuscates the, the problem of, uh, of the mutual benefits from putting the objects where they are most uh, valuable, right? And um, that's the one in the sense that we want to go beyond. We want to have something which is more subtle, more taking into account how the, your preferences, how your utility is helping generate more surplus, okay? And, and this, by the way, this lemma is very simple. You just look again to greedy versus frugal and you imagine there is just one greedy and one frugal. <clears throat> and then it's very easy to see that there are only two types of NV free allocations. Well, um, here, yeah, here I'm allowing uh, some number of greedy, some number of frugal, it doesn't matter. But either you, you, since everybody by eating the whole thing gets a total benefit of one, and one, remember one is the efficient surplus in this economy. I mean, you cannot generate more than one unit of surplus if you have one greedy and one frugal, right? So the only, uh, the only two types are either that one of the agents pays, um, get, sorry, eats all the goods and pays one half to the other, or uh, in which case they each get a utility of one half and there is no discrimination, or you give 
one object to uh, greedy, uh, some object to greedy, some object to frugal. So they both get a non-empty share. Of course, for greedy, it's worth nothing, but he's not envious, right? Because it's both shares, his and that of the others are worthless. So that's not envious. And that's uh, also uh, Pareto optimal, which in this context is a consequence of envious. So that one is uh, violates the positivity because you give nothing give nothing to greedy. So, okay. So there is this trade-off mm -hmm. and, and it means that, you know, when you use a good, uh, good um, guarantees, uh, you can more or less forget about uh, envy freeness. Um, okay. All right. So I think now I'm going to jump to the mechanism. But if there is, if there is only yeah. one object, wait, if there is only one object and one gets it and... Yes. That's and pays a half to the other. Oh, there is no difference. They are the same. Frugal and, and uh, exactly. greedy are the same. Exactly. Exactly. There is, difference so there is the no problem. Then there is no problem. Exactly. exactly. So, so the, the strict inequality is needed when you have only yes. these two goods. Yes. Otherwise, there is no. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Good. Okay. Well, no, so let's. Um, yeah, you see now a guarantee that I will be considering to be nice is. Well, uh, it will have to do with the mean max and the max mean. What, what's the mean max and the max mean in that problem? Those are the things which are referring to this uh, max mean share, I mean, discussed abundantly in the algorithmic uh, fair division recently. But in this context, <clears throat> it's clearly a quantity which is unfeasible. It's, uh, it's the quantity, uh, where is it? Um, right. The max mean utility is what you can obtain as a divider if you are offering a share to everybody and you are eating last. Everybody else is taking a share. So your strategy is simply to spread the shares in such a way that they are all of equal value. And remember with uh, cash compensation, you can do that exactly with adjusting the transfers. And you do that so as to maximize the total value of the partition that you create. And then the mean max is the same thing where this time you are a chooser and you eat first. So somebody is proposing you a partition and you are allowed to choose the one you like best. Uh, but then if the partition is adversarial, the one, the level you will guarantee is one nth of the, of the minimum of the, of the worst, the value of the worst uh, partition for you. So um, for the reasons uh, that I have to go over quickly, um, these are the two, these are, this is the, the interval where things are working well, um, because it's possible that in, on the one hand, this is uh, the interval where you get some interesting maximal guarantees. And also it's compatible, it can be compatible with positivity, discrimination, and maximality, as I say. Okay, and notice that just these properties without specifying exactly which guarantee already tell you that if the utility is additive, you should give the fair share. If the utility is sub-additive, so you are the good guy who is happy to have less than his share of object uh, intuitively, then you will get more than your fair share. And if your utility is super-additive, it's the opposite, you will get less at this level, just uh, we stop. Okay. All right. So first observation is that the multi-auction rule does not work in this context. I will not go over this formula. All, all it says is that you, you can still apply the multi-auction rule, right? You, uh, you bid on each object and then you apply the rule as before. Of course, there is no obvious, there is no obvious bid now because since your utility is no longer additive, you cannot attach to each object a constant marginal utility that it's, it's worth. So you bid something. And if you do it safely, you have to solve some uh, max mean type program like this one. So I just circle it so that you don't look at it because we will get some similar formulas in the second. But uh, you, can, you can guarantee something, but this something is even below the mean max level. It's even below anything that you can obtain, uh, for instance, in, a, in an MV3 allocation. So multi-auction- uh, what's PS? Yeah. What's PS here? 
PS, PS. Uh, oh, 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 sorry, sorry. Is price, P is a price, okay, over A, and P sub S means the, the total price of the set S. It's like the sum of the price over S. Is, uh, so, sorry, so P S sum over A of uh, in S of P A is the, the price of the share S. So there is an expression like that, which, you know, you, which tells you exactly the worst case maximization of the worst case. Well, I mean, look, you choose your price and then the other part, yes? The other yeah, yeah now, now I see the, okay, it's max over right, P, right. The fine. other party does okay. something and you look at the mean of that and the, the, the. Mm -hmm. So now the seller buyer, seller buyer uh, mechanism. So let's define SB2 of A, two, two agents. So they bid first to become the seller and the seller is the lowest bidder. Of course, if there is a tie, it doesn't matter who is seller or buyer for the criteria that I'm looking at. The lowest bidder with bid X chooses a price with, uh, of the objects with total value X. Huh? So what you announced as the total value, that's what you have to effectively implement by some arbitrary price, non-negative, non-negative. And at this price, the buyer buys whatever share he or she wants, possibly nothing at all. Doesn't have to buy and the seller eats the remaining object. So the allocation becomes, so if buyer chooses S, the buyer ends up with S and paying minus PS, and the seller ends up eating A minus S and cashing in P sub S, okay? How to bid safely? Okay, so if you, if you denote by delta X, the simplex of non-negative prices summing up to X, uh, you have to compare the worst utility if you win with the worst utility if you lose. But it's very clear uh, if you look a second that when you look at the worst utility if you win, um, what is it? Um, okay, so you won uh, with X, now you are choosing a price in Delta X, that's a max for you. But then the worst that can happen to you is that you, you have no control about whatever set of goods is taken by the other. So therefore minimum over all possible shares that the others buy, that the buyer decides to buy. So you get, here, here sorry, sorry, here it's the opposite, it's the complement. A minus T is what the buyers chose. So I get to eat T and he pays me for whatever he was buying. So minimum over T of UT plus P A minus T. Or rephrasing minimum max over P min over S of US minus PS. And since I was adding a P, uh, a P uh, A minus, sorry, a PT here, I have to, uh, I can put it here. So I receive my bid, but then whatever whatever at that price that I announced, the worst deal, which is typically negative, because of course uh, the, the S could be um, negative, the S could be empty, in which case this number is zero. So, so this minimum here is, um, is negative. So, uh, so this is a max mean, okay. And by the way, to study the property of these things, you have to use the to, to apply to that expression, the min max theorem, because in the expressing this as a min max works much better than that. But okay, I will not do that now. Now, if you lose, if you lose, so you were bidding too high. So the person who became the seller was bidding below you. But the worst that could happen to you is that he was bidding so close below you that it's as if he was bidding just like you. So at your price, at your announced bid of X, now the worst price shows up. The worst price showed up, minimum over P in Delta X. But then once you have the price, you can choose what you want. So at least you maximize UT minus PT. And remember, since uh, you can decide to not buy anything, you are sure not to lose money at this point or to your know, utility is at least uh, positive. Now, lemma, W2 is a concave and strictly increasing function 
from zero to U of A when X, when your bead increases at, at X equals zero, you will get zero and then X equal infinity, you get U of A. Whereas L2, L2 is convex and strictly decreasing. So, you know, if you draw, you have the X, oops, uh, you have X, oh, no. this is moving fast. Okay, up, you have, um, L, L is something like this, where X is here, W, w is concave, sorry, uh, not, not convex. And, uh, and L, L is, wow, okay. L is convex and decreasing. Not very pretty picture, I've done better. But um, anyway, they, they start, you know, they start from one from zero to U of A, the other from U of A to zero, they intersect for sure and it's unique. And that's your guarantee, uh, because by bidding below that, you risk uh, to end up on the W curve, and by bidding after that, you risk to end up on the losing curve. It's a standard uh, type of max min min equal min max. Okay, so it's not it's not uh, an, uh, a closed form expression, right? It's the intersection of those things. And n agent recursive definition is that. Each, so the, the first round of bid, you, you bid, and then you order the agents, you label them from the smallest to uh, the biggest. And what counts really is the person at the top who becomes the buyer. So the N minus one first agent, each pick a price, again, constrained by their own bid. And then agent N, the last one chooses which uh, objects to buy and pays to each of the other agents, whatever price they were uh, asking for, okay? So then this agent N leaves and the other are left, the N minus one are left with uh, the same mechanism of the four N minus one agent over the remaining object. Okay. No, the, 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 yeah. N, the N minus one, guys that bids lowest, each one sells a share of one over N of each good, or I'm, I'm not sure I understand what, what does each one of them is selling. Okay, if you, indeed. They are together selling the, the goods. Yes, but we are, remember, we are interested in the safe guarantee, the safe payment to an agent. So for instance, if you are additive, suppose your utility is additive, then your safe way here is when you bid, uh, your initial bid has to be one nth of the total value of the good. Now we are back to the fair share, you know, for the additive case, the fair share is marvelous. So you bid one nth of the value of the good for you. And now suppose you are a seller. Well, then you bid one nth of the actual utility of each, uh, of each object. Um, just um, sincerely, if you want, right? And that is the one that will guarantee to you, in this case, exactly the, the fair share, whether you lose or, or you win. But if you are not additive, then you have to solve a more complex max yeah. mean, a, a sequence of max mean, um, which are more complicated. But they will always get you, you know, something which is above the fair share if you are sub-additive, below if you are uh, super-additive and so forth, okay? So, so in some sense, so N, N faces prices for each good, also how much of that price is going to get to each one of the first N minus one people. Yeah, he, he just- That's the collection. The collection of the N minus one prices for all the goods means there is a total price for each good and also how it is split. Yes, yes. But yeah. if you want to, run this mechanism with maximal pr protection yeah. of privacy, you can simply communicate, you know, restrict the communication mm -hmm. so that I don't see the price of the other, except when they apply to me directly. And at that point I'm buying and disappearing. Yes, yes. Uh, but, then, but then you are solving, but then you are solving as if the N minus one are one player, they coordinate. No, no, I mean, no, no. To, to, get, no, no. to get the maximum equals mean max or whatever. 
for well, the solution that exists the next. Clinical mix man mean max is when you have those kind of expression, you can write them as mean max, which you know is technically more advantageous, but globally you don't have a max mean equal mean max. I mean it's a uh, um, no, it's a, it's just the fact that you are balancing between a winning utility which goes up and losing which goes up in your bid and losing which goes down in your bid and therefore it's at the intersection that no but finding the x star finding if i have to find my x i star okay yes. uh, i can do it just knowing my utility yes yes of course absolutely ah, okay okay absolutely you solve you solve this kind of okay um for instance okay Suppose you are with two agents and you determine the X star, all right? So now, if, if you are the winner with this X star, you will apply that program. You will apply the max. Uh, you will, this max is at a certain price. That's the price you will use. And you will wait for the others to do the buying. And the worst that could happen to you is that much. So using your safe strategy, you are guaranteed that level, but of course, in most of the time, it's that was really the pessimistic assumption, and you will get better than that, right? But the computation because when you are losing, it's in fact not X star; it's in fact something that is bigger, can only be bigger. So, uh, and that, yeah, no. and that's a place where everything should be good, not bad. Uh, yes, yes. I mean. Okay, if I have time, um, uh, I, no. <laughs> I can tell you what happens if you have neither good nor bad, but um, let me just uh, wrap up with the, the properties of the safe strategies. Uh, you know, I, I explain here that this is a sequence of uh, successive um, max mean or mean max problems, but once you understand the ID for two, that certainly is enough and you still have the properties for N agents, you know, that you have a concave increasing uh, utility in case you win and convex decreasing in case you lose. Okay, example, well, the example was uh, an example where your utility over the number of objects goes from zero to one and then, uh, but it's a dichotomous, it jumps at a certain moment theta. So this is an example which captures both the uh, extreme uh, greedy agents, the one who comes jumps to one only when theta is a, the total number M of objects, and uh, that's the greedy agent. And when theta equal one, that means as soon as you have one object, you reach one, that's the frugal agent, and then things in between. And if you compute, if you compute the guarantees corresponding to that, and you are, let's say, in the in the two-person case, uh, in the two-person case here, you see that you get something which varies nicely when theta equal one. It's uh, that is to say, you are frugal. You get m over m plus one uh, for theta equal one. This gives you uh, m over m plus one. So uh, with a large number of objects, you are almost guaranteed your full value. And when theta equal m, you are the greedy, then this is one over m plus one. So you get really a tiny piece uh, as, as you are greedy and there are more and more objects that you are claiming. So it, it has the nice uh, sort of normative translation of this idea that the more subadditive you are, the better for you and so forth. Okay. All right. And um, here is a nice conjecture. <laughs> I mean, we, it's easy to prove that for two people, this guarantee is maximal. Uh, not easy at all uh, to the extent that we are not sure exactly which way it goes, whether it's maximal in general. Okay. Uh, maybe one minute, two minutes, uh, Moshe, or just, hello? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, no, ju just, uh, I just want to show one last example because that one, uh, it came up uh, relatively late um, in, the, um, in the preparation, but it, it's really fun, I think. Uh, so the case of bad objects, that's um, more or less symmetric and uh, nothing, nothing special 
is happening there. But uh, where it's fun is when you have fully general externalities, because you can, in principle, you can you can generalize the thing, uh, but it becomes more complicated. Why? Because objects now can be good for me, bad for you, or neither good nor bad for me. Their marginal utility can be sometimes positive, sometimes negative, and in a completely arbitrary way. So it's very complicated. So we can adapt the mechanism, but by making the message more complicated. After the first round, so you start the bidding exactly the same way. The lowest bid becomes the seller. Let's say there are only two people. The winner then chooses not only a price, but a partition of goods that he labels as good and others as bad. And what does it mean? It means that if, if you want to get an object which I call A, I should not say good here. And remember, I've put a label on the objects. Those are I call good, those are I call bad. Now, if you want to acquire for you one of those I call good, you pay me PA. But now, if you don't, if you want to buy one that I call bad, that's free. But if you don't get the one I call bad, you pay me for that, okay? So it's, it's exactly like the usual price, except that all the prices are in positive. So when it comes for a bad, it's the right not to eat that bad that you pay for. And the nice thing is that this allows you to solve situation where really normally you, you don't know what to do. Think of the case of single peak and single deep utilities. Those are you know, classic uh, examples. So you have, let's say, a number of objects, five identical objects, identical, zero, one, two, three, four, five. But then agent one, agent U has single peak utility. So zero for zero object, but also zero for five object. Two for one, three, three, two. So consuming two or three is okay. After that, uh, it's, it's death, okay? So, and similarly, you have single peak. Uh, it's bad one, bad two, but then you go back to all of them, it's okay. So what do you do there? In principle, because they are identical, the reaction would be that the price should actually be the same for all. But in fact, the good way to guarantee something significant, namely one and three sevens, is by making an arbitrary differentiation between goods that you call good, three of them, and goods that you call bad, an object, sorry, object that you call good, three of them, object that you call bad, two of them, with the proper price being uh, adjusted, you end up by guaranteeing this. I mean, and the idea is simply, since I have two of my objects which are bad if you and three which are good, if you don't buy anything, will you still have to pay me for those two bads? If you start also eating those bads, so you don't pay me for that, but now my share reduces, so I'm happier if I'm the single pick. And if you start eating a lot, a lot, then now you start eating the object that I call good, and that also brings me money. So in the end, I never end up uh, with the zero at, at either end. So, so that I, it becomes, of course, a much less easy uh, mechanism to sell because now your choice is not only the price, but which subset you will call uh, good and bad. And that, of course, uh, increases quite a bit the complexity. But so it's not clear whether it will be um, feasible in practice. Okay, so, so that's it. Huh? I mean, the, these are my conclusion. Um, okay, can you the see the theorem, the theorem on, on the properties of the mechanism that you had? Yeah, it, it went by too quickly. I want to see it again. Okay. And uh, you can continue talking, but just I want to see the theorem. <laughs> yes, but uh, you know, I'm like Gerald Ford uh, <clears throat> to, to think. No, no, I mean, if you, are, if you are done. No, no, sorry, if you are done, I, I mean. Uh, I, I, I am essentially done. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the properties after that are, are a bit more uh, specialized. If you want, for instance, there is the property of when do you get the, the standalone upper bound? Because sometimes it's possible that in this game of buy and sell, you could end up 
um, with more than the value of the good. So you violate both ND freeness and that standalone bond, bound, but there we have results that shows that it's not very frequent. I mean, as, as, as soon as you have some balancedness condition and so forth. So, um, so, okay, so, but then, yeah, I mean, if you start by the, you know, the simple auction of the bundled object, it's very simple, it's very safe. Uh, you can, you ensure your NV freeness at uh, zero cost, and if you want, <clears throat> and the standalone, but you do something which from the point of view of ex-ante fairness is, we argue, uh, not, uh, not defensible because you are really, treating the exactly the same people, extremely subadditive or extremely super additive. And that is not a palatable uh, principle. Uh, the multi-auction will only be uh, fully efficient if utilities are additive or presumably close to additive, of course, but otherwise it gives a very poor guarantee even below the, max, the mean max, therefore not NV freeness, it ensures no NV freeness and no standalone upper bound. So it's, it's not good outside of the additive domain. Now the seller buyer mechanism, and we certainly don't claim that it has a unique virtue of satisfying those properties. I mean, there is no characterization result of that sort, of course, uh, but its cognitive effort is comparable to that of the multi-auction, but with much stronger ex-ante guarantees and the, those normative property of being positive and discriminating. It's not compatible with NV freeness, but this is a fact of life as long as you are uh, agreeing to reward subadditive utilities and penalize uh, super additive ones, okay? Uh, as far as implementing the standalone upper bound, <clears throat> it's not that your guarantee itself would be more than the value of the objects to you. It's more that if you are lucky after winning the auction, the other might buy so much uh, things that you know, your bid will pay you more than the value of the object. Okay, and then, and then a nice property of it is that it generalizes to um, many other contexts without monotonicity, of course, at the cost of um, complexity. And the next step we have is to, and now it's really gonna be <clears throat> numerical experiments to to try to understand the efficiency performance. I mean, if you, if you assume that your agents are simply simple-minded and naive and they just use the safe strategy, if you run little um, simple experiment, a numerical uh, the test, uh, numerical examples, you see that you very often come pretty close to being efficient. You don't lose too much. But the, the problem of trying to estimate, you know, in on average, how much you lose, very, very difficult. So, so we, we will we plan only to do some numerical simulations and then see if it gives us some inspiration. Thank you very much. Sorry to okay. go a bit over time. Thank you very much.